Good morning, Saints. Uh, this is Moore's lesson. I have someone touched on my heart concerning the gospel, concerning what God wants us to hear, how God wants us to think, how God wants us to speak. And I believe this is what we all need in order to get our minds right before Him, how we communicate. Uh, the question and the comment concerning where is that at in the Bible, it should be repeated more often. Where can I read that at in the Bible? It will assist us in seeking for truth instead of making it up. When we get in a conversation where there's multiple people that are communicating, uh, the title today is, You Shall Not Have Occasion to Use This Proverb. You Shall Not Have Occasion to Use This Proverb. Coming from Ezekiel chapter 18, uh, verses 1. And so it was not a, an instruction or a commandment prior to this for them not to say it. It was not an instruction by God for them not to say it. But here's what they were saying in verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, saith the Lord God, you shall not have occasion any more, any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But if a man be just, and do that which is lawful and right. Okay, so here we have a scenario where they're saying a proverb. The proverb has a meaning that they're saying. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 1 and 4. That proverb was, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are on edge. They were, everybody was saying this. You know, it's kind of like we have uh, sayings that are in the church of Christ. You know, women, you know, they're not supposed to wear pants. You know, uh, and which is uh, contrary to the scriptures, you know, in the, as they brought into the congregation in the past. But the idea is that they were saying that the father, the son is going to take the sins of the father. Or because the father has eaten sour grapes, the son has to now pay for the sins of the father. That's what they were saying, or what they were teaching. And so, again, before they were saying this proverb, God never said to not say it. You know what I mean? He never said, don't say this proverb. But it started in their hearts. What this proverb does is, it goes against God. It goes directly against the scriptures. Because... God did not set up a, a rule where now the son has to pay for all the sins of the father. Look at verse, uh, verse 17. It says, no, I'm verse 18, I'm sorry. As for the father, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. Yet say ye, why doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the son hath done that which is lawful and right, and have kept all my statutes, and have done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. And so this is just a saying, this proverb is a saying that goes against how God thinks, how God rules concerning now the son has to bear the, the dad's iniquity. And that's not how God is judging a thing. And so today we may have other sayings that we come up with. Uh, go ahead. Ezekiel chapter 18. I mean 18. 18. 18. Yes, 18. And so some may say, uh, some may say in the body of Christ, we sin every day. You know, word, thought, or deed. But there's no scripture that teaches us that we sin every day in word, thought, or deed. Now, if that scripture is readable, then we could read it, and then we could believe it. But there's no scripture that teaches us that every day we sin in word, thought, or deed. There's temptations that could, that could deceive you as a, being a sin, but it's not a sin. Jesus said, you were with me in my temptations. He didn't say you were with me in my sins. And so, don't let the temptation guide you to think that you just committed a sin when it wasn't an iniquity. That was just a temptation. And so we have to be careful to re repeat the oracles of God because then we'll begin to falsely accuse and then create a scripture that doesn't exist just like they created uh, this proverb, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. 
And so we have to be aware uh, of our communication that they be oracle spoken and not mind uh, created, mind created from the thoughts. Another one is Jeremiah chapter 7. Look at Jeremiah chapter 7. So what they're doing is they're just creating thoughts that sound similar to the Bible. Sounds kind of like it, but it's not the exact thing that God has said. And that's what we have to be careful of, things that look similar, things that look kind of the same. You know, we have to be careful with that. I want to read this. I know uh, Brother Kevin has his hand up. Uh, I want to read verse quickly, uh, 1 through 7. Jeremiah chapter 7, 1 through 4. Jeremiah 7, 1 through 4. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah. They are entering at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if ye thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if ye thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if ye oppress not the stranger and the fathers, and the widows and the shed not and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt, then will I cause you to dwell in this place and in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying words, you cannot profit. And so, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, lying, these are lying words to God because they're saying these are, these are the temple of the Lord. And so, they're blinding themselves where they're committing sin in the background and they're just saying that to cover up their sin. And that's what this saying that they were saying God did not uh, approve of. Uh, Brother Kevin Green had his hand up. Yeah, I just uh, I just falsely accused uh, my sister because I had thought I heard how the words was being expressed, but I can say that because of my poor hearing, I misinterpreted what was said, thinking that this person meant meant it this way, but now. I come to realize that I was in error because I didn't hear the words properly how they will, how they came out, and so that's an example of false accusing someone is because you may have misinterpreted what what they said and how the words was, was being spoken. So I would draw my own conclusion, thinking that it meant this when it meant something told the total opposite so that's because Jesus himself was a was an excellent listener he listened very well and and they had men that was twice his age was astonished because here's a man that was 12 years old had the knowledge you know of men that are twice his age and they was astonished as to how this man knew so much at an early age because Jesus ministry started early so you can imagine how much knowledge he had acquired at 12 years of age up until you know the time that of his death at 30 uh, whatever age he was so listening is very important so you know that's just something that I have to admit that I did something that was a false accusation against my sister in Christ, uh, which which I was wrong. So I just wanted to just kind of throw that out. Just uh, <coughs> oh, okay. I was just reminded of the scripture where it says, "Flee the very appearance of evil," and it also we have the scripture that says, "Shall we sin?" So shall we sin that grace may abound? You know, God gave us the gift of forgiveness, but let us not use that as an occasion or liberty to sin. Because I've heard some Christians say, well, God knows that this is my, my, my problem, my issue. I'll just go, and they'll be premeditated. They're doing what they're doing, but they're saying that they're going to go and ask God to forgive them. Uh, ask for forgiveness, but it's premeditated in that they are taking a gift, a liberty that God has allowed us. They're taking it and using it not to the honor and glory of God. 
they're using it to their own uh, self-destruction. And when we look at 1 John, I wanted to look at this too, and look what 1 John 1 says. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. This is 1 John 1 and 4. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ's son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we declare ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. But yet we know Christ, uh, we are Christians, we are followers of Christ. We know when Christ walked this earth, he was perfect. He was completely sinless. That's why, too, we need Christ. We need God to help us to be overcomers. We got many scriptures that says that we are overcomers. Like you said, a temptation is a temptation is a temptation until it's acted upon. Am I correct? It's just a temptation. When it's acted upon and it's, it's one that pertains to sin, then it becomes sin. But you can't continue to put yourself in a position to be tempted and say, I'll ask God to forgive me. Now you're taking a gift, a liberty that we have, and you're using it uh, incorrectly. And understand this too. We know God knows our hearts. If we understand that, you can never at no time play God. You can fool the people, but you can never fool God. And who we and, and you know, I read in my Bible that at the end it says every knee it will bow and it's going to we're going to bow before our master and we're gonna give an account of what we did in this life. That's right. God bless you to come. Every knee shall bow, scripture says. Every knee shall bow. You know, and there was a point in the Old Testament, you know, Josiah, it reminds me of Josiah, where he tore up and broke uh, the images, uh, the sculptures that were made for false gods, and also Hezekiah as well, and uh, Jehu, when he killed all the servants of Baal, you know, that was eradicated, that sin was diminished uh, from Israel, and there was a change that happened afterward. And there was other sins that they were committing, whether it be lying, whether it be stealing. But there was many saints, you know, like Paul, like Job, where the scripture says, you know, this was, he was a perfect man and upright. You know, exactly. Perfect man and upright. And so that's the word of God. The, the words of God are calling him that. And so when you, when you look at who's going to go to heaven, when you go to heaven, you can't have sin on you. You have to be blameless. And... The way we see it and the way God sees it, that we're perfect, is two different definitions. The way we view it and the way God sees it, two different ways. Clean. Because they may not have perfection in all the knowledge or the remembrance of the scriptures, but perfection in sanctification is where God will see and say, this is enough. You have accumulated much knowledge, but you, have no, you committed no sin or offense against me. And this day you will come be with me in paradise or you will go to heaven when he returns. And so we have to acknowledge also that part of the scriptures. There's that side that Sister Carr talked about. And then there's the other side that God talks about. And so we have to look at both angles of the scriptures. You know, this lesson came from a conversation that, uh, that was had. I uh, had a, a talk with Brother Ozan. Uh, he said, have you ever recognized uh, something that you taught false or, and then corrected it? Or something that you, you know, made an error on and corrected it. And then, he, because he came from, uh, in Job chapter 1, he taught a lesson concerning the sons of God. 
He said, Now there was a day, Job 1 6, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. You know, and there was two definitions concerning Genesis 6 and Job 1 6 concerning the sons of God. And Brother Ozan uh, corrected it concerning uh, those are not angels. Uh, both of these are talking about, uh, you know, sons of God in the sense of uh, on earth, children of God on earth. Because remember, the devil got kicked out from heaven where the angels were. You know, he, he didn't go back with the angels and be among them afterward. And so, and I asked the question to myself, you know, what have I corrected? Or is there anything that I'm holding now? That is an error, and I, as I was scanning through my mind, I was in. I remembered uh, concerning uh, Revelations uh, 21, verse 27, where it talks about, and I taught this to the teens, where it talks about uh, the nothing shall come in that makes a lie, in verse 27, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defiles, neither whatsoever works abomination. Or make it a lie. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And the doctrine was this. The doctrine was. What if we go up there and commit sin again. That was a, the doctrine that was taught. But this scripture validates. That God will not allow anything in that defiles. Or that makes something defiled. Anything that works abomination. Or makes a lie. And so concerning what I had. I had to throw it away and accept this scripture that says God will not allow in, in any way, in any way, when it says in no wise, in any way, He'll allow anything like that uh, to come in. And so, what we mentioned in the beginning, Ezekiel chapter 18, concerning that proverb where the parents have eaten, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the sons or the children's teeth are on edge. That's the same. You know, and the question I ask today is, what are sayings in the church that are big and popular that grow, but versus the Word of God, they have no power? In other words, versus the Word of God, they have uh, no weight uh, that could that could be validated. And so this is important because, you know, these sayings have to be removed. Let's go to Revelations uh, chapter 2, verse 14. They have to be removed because God hates these sayings. And as quick and as witty as that may sound, the fathers of Eden saw grace, the children's teeth on our edge. Everybody's saying it. Everybody, all Israel's saying it. And it sounds cute. It sounds uh, popular. You know, it sounds like something you could put on your shirt. But the idea is that God doesn't respect it. God doesn't, I don't like that because it goes against my judgment. You're saying that I judge that the sin that the father does, the son got, got to pay for it. That's what you're saying. Uh, look at Revelations uh, chapter 2 verse 14. It says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them, has there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. It says, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly. And will fight against him with the sword of my mouth. And so he recognized the, the, the things that they were holding on to. The doctrine of the, the Nicolaitans. The doctrine of Balaam. They were holding on to it in their heart. It was in the midst of their heart. A way of a, where there would be a proverb like Ezekiel 18 teaches. Where there would be a thought that comes from the Baptists. Or a thought that comes from the Catholic Church. Like Brother Ozan talked this morning concerning... Uh, marriage, divorce, remarriage. I uh, started from the Catholic Church. That's a thought that is held in the Church of Christ. And God hates that thought. So every time you come and you come to church, the thought is in your heart. You may have the rest of the part right, the doctrine right, but it's just in your heart, in your mind, and it's just you hold it on to it. And you don't want to let go because it's, it's, it's like your baby, your precious baby that you've you nurtured and taught everybody. And you don't want to let it go because you've drawn it so close to your heart. You repeated it so much that you deceive your own mind to think that it's true. Just like they did the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Or the, the fathers have eaten sour grapes. You know, look at uh, Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. So this morning's lesson, 
You shall not have occasion to use this proverb. You shall not have occasion to use this proverb or a saying that you say. I thought I seen somebody. No. Matthew chapter 28, looking at verse um, 11. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came to the city and showed unto the chief priest all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large sum, large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. That's the saying. Stole him away while we slept. He says, And if this come to the governor's ear, we will persuade him, and he says, Secure you. So he took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying, it says, this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. That saying, that same saying is still being broadcast, still being published among the Jews until that day. And it's sad because they've seen the angels. They've seen the power of God. However, they decided to take money over truth. And the rest, they spread this lie to the rest of the Jews, and the rest of the Jews were believing it. Even today, you go to Jerusalem, talk to the people over there, they, they'll say, Jesus has, or the Christ hasn't come yet. Jesus wasn't the Christ. That doctrine is like all over that location and across uh, overseas. You know, where they're mixed blood, or they have that in the midst of them, that Christ has not come back yet. Uh, Brother Hampton has hand up. Uh, yeah, I, I just listened to you. I was thinking about um, just how things change over time. You know what I mean? And how truth can be lost in a sea of error, in in this, like amongst the masses. I would say, yes. like truth doesn't change. It's still what it always has been and always will be. But the 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 perception of the populace changes over time. You know, I was uh, teaching the teenagers uh, Wednesday, and we were just talking about uh, talking about the traditions of men, uh, and being careful not to be led by blind men, because they both you, the follower and the leader, both fall into the ditch. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you know, I was just talking about how people twist, how people twist truth to and bend truth to their to their to fit their tradition. Or they overlook or sidestep truth in order to uphold their tradition, their opinion, their perception of whatever it is, whatever the subject that you're dealing with. And I was telling them about homosexuality. I was like, you know, back in the, like, you know, 30, 40 years ago, homosexuality was like an outlay, like a, you know, it's like an outlying perversion. You know what I mean? They were laws and it was illegal to be a homosexual. You know what I mean? And then, like, but you fast forward and now all of a sudden, like, it's like, it's cool to be homosexual. You know what I mean? Like that is like that's the thing. You know what I mean? You have girls that's like twelve years old, thirteen, talking about they have girlfriends and like little boys. Like my like Makaya came home, he's like, half my class is gay. What? Yeah, he's eleven. You know, and it's just like but that's what's on T V. That's like, everywhere. Like homosexuality is like it's cool. And enough people have said that you're born that way and that you shouldn't hate homosexuality and all this kind you're a hate mongrel. That everybody think like it, everybody has the same mentality like you have people that closely still understand the truth but they say I mean you know not that I have anything against it they'll say or they be like you know I mean people can do what they want to do you know, I ain't knocking it but I mean I just don't that kind of thing you know what I mean and so I, I was just thinking about thinking about what you were saying how how he said that this saying is 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 commonly reported until this day you know I mean it, on the day that it happened there were people that saw the truth those guards saw this angel come. You see what I'm saying? And they reported what they were told. Like, they reported what they told to the chief priest. They had no answer, so they came up with a lie. So tell them, they gave them a large sum of money, and they said, tell the people, tell the story that the disciples came and stole it. Now, the people that hear it from, from the week, days and the weeks and the months later, and as the word continues to spread, that becomes the truth amongst the public, is that, oh, well, they just came and stole the body. But the reality, that don't change the reality and the truth of the matter is that an angel came and rolled a stone back. And, you know what I mean, like, 
And so, and I, I was just thinking about you. We, you have, like the truth never goes away. The truth is always there. And as a saint, you have to make sure that you hold the truth regardless to what the, what's commonly reported amongst the populace. You know what I mean? Because now they have a new thing. Eh, not really new, but like with the homosexual, with the homosexual community having won their victory. I use quotation marks in society to where like homosexuality is okay and it's basically accepted and like that's what it is like now the pedophile is coming out yeah. and you're starting to see like they having conventions and stuff like that yeah and they're like hey and they and they're and their their platform is they're separating child abuse from child love right that's what they're trying to do and they're saying that you know just because a person's a pedophile doesn't mean that they're a child abuser just because they have attraction to a child doesn't mean that they're going to go around just kidnapping and raping children. You see what I'm saying? That's, and that's the thing. But it's the same ploy, the same card that the homosexual play. It's just love. You can't have a law on love. You know, law, love can't be something, love can't be a bad thing. Love is always a good thing. Blah, 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 blah. And so, like, they're going to try to fight it. The homosexuals are going to try to fight it at first because they don't agree with it. But they're going to lose their argument because it's the same argument that you played. So then they're going to say, oh, well, it, it, I may not agree with it personally, but who am I to judge of another person you can love? A person say, a child, a father loves his child and a child loves his father. How can you say a child is not com uh, capable of love? Blah, 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 blah. They're going to come with all this stuff. But at the end of the day, God is already determined. You see what I'm saying? Like, the truth don't change because people decide, no matter how many people agree with something, the truth doesn't change. And so you're talking about people have these proverbs or these sayings and they become popular and people start to believe them. That doesn't change the truth. And there are always going to be people that know the truth because the truth is what it is. I always say like, and I'm done, two plus two is four. It doesn't matter. And you have all these people trying to, and to say society, everybody trying to change terms and change the meaning of words and stuff like that. So they say male is not male. Male, masculine doesn't have to mean manly it can mean anything a woman can be masculine whatever you know what i mean they so everybody trying to just trying to like it's basically like the bible says in genesis 5 uh genesis 6 every man did what was right in his own sight right right and that's what the world well our society is coming to anyway where everybody's trying to do right with their own sight, but they're going to it's going to self-destruct you know what i mean but with all that being said and whatever the saints shouldn't fear because the reality is that truth will always be truth two plus two is all gonna be four it doesn't matter how you try to change it. Two plus two is going to be four. Point blank period. And so, like, a man and a woman fit together. It don't matter how much you want to try to change that or whatever you try to, like, whatever. Naturally, a man and a woman fit together. You can't, you can't change that. And if you want human beings, a man and a woman got to fit together. That's just how it, how it works. You can try to say what you want to say. And so, and the same thing goes with the truth. The truth is going to be true regardless. There's always going to be one God. You can't change the word. Like he has one son. His son brought one doctrine from his father. He gave it to his 12 disciples. They took one doctrine. He formed one church. There's only one way to seven. You can't change those things. And people can say what they want to say and try to like finagle it as they have. That's why you have all these different denominations. But like the Bible is going to say what it's always said. And there ain't no way you're going to be able to get around that. Amen. God bless you. And uh, two women, two men, they can't create a child. It's not how God, it's not how God planned it and orchestrated it in that fashion. And uh, just a, a call I had a hand up. I want to read this scripture before I pass it. Uh, Judges 21, 25, what Brother was referencing. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own sight. And so currently today we have a king in the kingdom, which is Christ. And we don't do what's right in our own sight. We do what's right in God's eyesight. The world, they're ruled by Satan. And Satan, he says, you can do whatever you want in your own eyesight. Whatever is right in your own eyesight. That's their king. That's their ruler. And he gives them the rule of doing how they want to do it. And so, therefore, it's going to, that's uh, Judges 21-25. Sister Carl had a hand up. Yeah, I'm just thinking about this uh, scripture. It is no longer I, but... But, uh, but Christ that liveth in me. And I may have uh, misquoted it, but uh, we are about living for Christ. Uh, I was just looking as we, uh, looking at Job 38, we were talking about Job, you started talking about Job. 
And the Bible lets us know that uh, Job was a good man. He was an upright man. And uh, he, uh, Satan wanted to challenge that. But I, I wanted to bring out this point. Job, even as a man, got off just a little bit. Because when we look at Job 38, it says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and see it because before this Job begins to question Elihu was the young man that was closest to the truth I think that is was closest to the truth and then uh, Job proceeded to uh, make his statements but then in Job 38 it says then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said who is this that darkened counsel by words without knowledge mm -hmm. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. And so God present, uh, goes on to ask uh, different questions that is no way that Job could have answered. And then Job in 42, Job 42 says, and Job, you know, I often wondered, uh, uh, my fellow brothers and sisters, I don't, at this point, let, first let me read this. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou can do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak, I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. And you know, uh, Brother Teacher often wondered, was this, could this be a sin that was not unto death? You know, there is a sin that is not unto death. I, I, and, and understanding that scripture, in other words, what David, when God told him to gird him up and he proceeded to ask, the, David realized, you know what, I was off a little bit on this. But he took and he repented and he said, he said, I abhor and repent in dust and ashes. And I thought about that scripture we were talking about sin. There is a sin and that's in 1 John 5, I believe, uh -huh. that is not unto death. I think it was uh, uh, someone to help me, wasn't it with uh, when, uh, who was it with the showbread? Was it uh, David? Uh -huh. David with the showbread. That was a sin that was not unto death. But I was in studying, I guess this is something we would have to look back at, but I guess what my question is, is he proceeded to, to make his statements, but God had to bring him to himself. But God said from the beginning, and let God be true in every man alive. He said uh, Job was a upright, he was a good man, he was a perfect man, that's what he said. So that he, he, he said that in the beginning, but it shows you, and what this, this brings to me is that's why we're going to always need Christ our righteousness will never exceed that of our Lord and Savior never and the thing about this scripture is that he was tested and this testing point he couldn't handle it he broke he broke in the sense of before God he broke down because of the communication that was being had after he realized his position after he realized his sin, God perfected him again. Yeah. Because he wasn't born. When he was born, he was born and then he committed sin. But the scriptures also talk about, which is not according to what happened to him, was God has made me to remember the sins of my youth, which is not the reason why he was going through that. That's not the reason why he was going through In his mind, he thought, I'm going through this because of the sense of my youth. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he, was, he, was, he was tagging, he was trying to guess and tag at mm -hmm. things at why this was happening uh, to him. Uh, but the idea is that afterward, after uh, he went through all that, God gave him the things again, and then he was perfected in his walk. Where the, also, the scriptures also talk about him being a constant, a person that will constantly offer sacrifice for his kids, one who will constantly rebuke. Uh, as they were, you know, the details of how he lived, what type of man he was, were in their words also, his other friends, his three friends. He was all, always one that would reprove, correct, be merciful, uh, be patient. And so God's seen that walk. Uh, but, you know, he did commit sins in his youth. And so how can God call him perfect? Because he was perfected by taking heed 
to God as, as he grew up. And, and so God looks at us, he looks down from heaven, he sees our, what we did in our past, our present, and he sees our current state. You know, and it's him that, and this is something we can't take away from God and Christ and the Holy Spirit, is that he said, I work, tomorrow I work, my father works also. Their work is to constantly perfect us in the walk, removing sin and purify us. And so to say, is, to say that Christ and God, they're not doing their job, they are doing their job. Amen. And there's a lot of individuals in the church who are giving heed to the Son and the Father and the Holy Ghost and agree to the job and, and the work that God wants to do in the soul. So God has a work that, that He wants to do in the soul. And our souls and minds have to be in agreement with that work and allow the doctor to operate, you know, not fight against them, but let, allow him to operate and to remove it and implant uh, that scripture or that word that comes directly from him. And so he's constantly working every day. Uh, some need more work than others, depending on how, and his mercy is what is allowing them to stay alive and to not condemn them because he's working on them and he's not casting them into, into hell, but he's removing this sin and then that sin. And then a week passes, then they don't do that sin anymore. Then they don't do this sin anymore. Now they're walking after Christ. And then God can see this is a strong saint. Because he's been perfected in the sense of the sins that they used to do, they don't do anymore. Until a, until a situation like Job happens, where they may face a scenario where it's just too heavy to, to, to hold on to or to, to fight. Now they may be able to fight it. They may remember, remember. We got the New Testament, so we can remember the trial of Job. If you remember the trial of Job, you may be able to overcome it. You know, because now we have New and Old Testament. You know, Job just had Old Testament. We have Christ, and we have the Law of Moses. And so, uh, we uh, somebody had their hand up, I believe, uh, Brother Kevin. His hand up. Uh, he knows the thought. He knows the thought of all men. You know at the same time so that's that's powerful within itself but um you're talking about sin is that god even knows the type of sins you're going to think about committing even in the future because he already knows you know right. he already knows every every individual's mindset what they're thinking even as of right now as we speak and he even knows the thoughts he knows the intent of the heart of, of what thoughts that you're going to have in your mind even for the future or committing any future sins and so the bible talks about plotting to do evil even in micah chapter 2 and verse 1 talks about that about plotting to do iniquity so i would just 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 putting that thought out you know for y'all to kind of just think about you know that because God made us from creation that even if we have some evil thoughts in our mind that we're plotting to do maybe like months ahead or months later God already knows it before it even comes to your mind and what you're planning to do far ahead so it's just something you know for each of us to just think about God bless you. Sister Carr had a hand up. Okay, this is just my last. I was going to read that. Uh, that's found in 1 John 5. Okay, 1 John 5. Uh -huh. And it says, I'll start at 1 John 5 uh, at verse 12. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him. Confidence. You know, when I think of confidence, I, this is the hope that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life. For them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. 
all unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not unto death and we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not but he that is begotten of sin keepeth himself and that wicked one toucheth him not and you know we as Christians uh, I think about the scripture where it says flee the very appearance of evil mm -hmm. what we ought to do is not to sin not to sin that's what we ought to do but if we do sin we have a gift of the father that we, that's exactly right and he will forgive us if we truly have godly sorrow and repent and that's another thing too that David taught me too uh, the annals of time you are to have godly sorrow you are to truly be repentive in your heart for any sin that you commit but shall we sin that grace may abound no we don't play with sin and we as Christians don't want to get caught up in uh, trying to discern between sin and a sin not unto death just don't sin if that's you right. can that's right. that's so it's one that's not repented of that's you know, right. sin unto death that's is one that's not exactly repented of right. and I want to just I wanted to add concerning uh, uh, what was said uh, Saul you know it was said that Saul uh, that's the name that he had F that represents sin. You know, it is said that Saul's name represents sin, was the old old person, and Paul's name represents Christianity. Which scripturally the Bible says that Saul Saul was called uh, Saul in the book of Acts as a Christian. And there's scriptures that teaches that in Acts chapter eleven uh, verse thirty there's records that show that he was called Saul even as a Christian. So I want to add that because it could spread abroad concerning that saying or that type of proverb in Acts chapter 11 look at verse 30 uh, the scripture says which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul now this was the money that was sent uh, uh, due to the the plague or the famine uh, that was had and the, it says verse 29 the disciples every man according to his ability determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea and it says that it was it was given by to Saul and Barnabas now this was him as a Christian another one is in Acts 12 verse 25 where the scripture uh, says verse 24 but the word of God grew and multiplied and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John who was surnamed uh, Mark now I want to add that because Saul well, now I understand that Saul is a Hebrew name. Uh, Paul is a uh, Roman name. Is a Gentile name. And so when God, understand that when God sent Paul to do work for the Gentiles, then the scriptures in Acts begins to call him uh, Paul. It begins to mention him more as Paul. And when he was working with the, the Jews more, they it would call him Saul, which is his uh, Hebrew name. And so, it, re it references Saul again when he retells the story to the Gentiles, when he's standing before the Gentiles. And as he's retelling the story of his, uh, when he was knocked off the, the horse, he's saying, Saul, Saul, why has thou persecuted me? Again, he's telling the, the audience in front of the Gentiles that in the Hebrew tongue, his name in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, that's what Jesus called him in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why has thou persecuted me? So they can understand this is how Jesus talked to me in that tongue in that language and so he was saying this before uh the, the gentiles so i was just adding that concerning uh you know in the, if anyone says saul represents sin and then paul represents christian that's scripturally i mean there's some scriptures that talk about uh names being changed but still you know jacob uh was still called god still called him jacob even though he, he says israel but he still called him jacob in the sense of uh, after during the other books of the Old Testament and so there's different reasons why names were changed in the Bible God changed names uh, Abraham Abram to Abraham the father of, of all na many nations or the father of, of one nation which is the Jew the Hebrews but we have to read the answer on what God did concerning why this name was changed why this wasn't why God did a thing because what happens is it causes confusion 
and it doesn't line up with the other scriptures. It doesn't fit if you do something like that. Uh, Sister, Car- oh, brother ha- Hamilton had his hand up. I did first. No, he he did when you were oh, talking. Okay, that's okay. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm just trying so to be quick. fair. I'm just mine trying to be fair. Go, brother Hamilton, mine was gonna be so quick. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say too. I too went back and studied that. Did some more study on that, and we'll see in uh, Acts 13 and 9. It said, "Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him." And we know that Paul was going to be about setting up many Gentile churches. He was an apostle to the Gentile. He was setting up many uh, Gentile churches. And when I was going back and uh, studying that. Paul was another name for it was the Gentile name of Saul. Uh-huh. Yes. He was the Gentile name of Saul, and I wanted to say I, uh, that which you were saying about some said this meant that, and that that was error. I think you said you said one was evil and one was. Is that what you said? Yes. Uh-huh. But it just said that that was. Uh, and, but you know what I wanted to, and maybe as you giving the mic to Brother Hamilton. Uh, uh, the question I think was asked did Saul was his did God change his name? I think that was the original question. Oh no, the that was his name, the Hebrew name is a that's in a, exactly in a Gentile name. right, because yes. that's what I understood yes. from my study. Yes. It wasn't like Abram changed to Abraham. Yes. Uh-huh. Sarah, Sarah to Sarah. Mm-hmm. God bless it was you. just this was the Gentile uh, part of uh, oh, like his so. name maybe Jose. Yes. Or, okay, Javier, Javier. Yeah. Javier. Mm-hmm. And that's, see, that's right. clearing it up. But it wasn't where God himself changed it like he did. Right. He, right. he right. has right. done that, but in this case. Okay, I'm sorry, did Brother Man. Hamilton. <laughs> Great comments. Thank you, Brother Hamilton. No, yeah. Uh, I was just going, like, you know, the question that Sister Carr asked, I was uh, just going to give an answer as far as that being a sin not unto death. Uh, when that whole story with Job starts out, God, you know, the devil comes to God and says, hey, man, you know, I'm coming to and fro looking who I'm, you know, trying to sift somebody. I'm trying to get somebody. He said, have you considered Job? You know what I mean? So God puts Job into this situation, or he volunteers Job to be put into this situation. Now, Job, as, as Brother Javier pointed out, Job's heart, and I guess that I answered the question before I even go into all that. It's a matter of the heart. At the end of the day, because David doesn't sin unto death, like he's supposed to die for that, but it's because of his heart and because of his, his he sought out repentance from a from a pure heart or from a repented heart that God was willing to show mercy. So at the end of the day, it comes down to, and I, and I think her answer, the answer she gave was valid too. It doesn't this because you can, it doesn't matter. Like rebellion, you can die for in the sight of God. Fear. It's something that you can die for and go to hell for right. if it's unrepentant of. It don't matter what you do. That's because it says all sin, is, all unrighteousness is sin. So it don't matter what you do if it's un, unrepentant of. It comes from an unrepentant heart. Then you you are subject to death as a result of it. But but with the situation with Job, you you see that this is a situation where Job was tested. He crumbled under pressure and started speaking things he ought not speak and saying things he ought not say. And then God in turn came and set him straight. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, Job is still blessed. He's blessed in his station before the before the trial, or the station after the trial was better than the one that he had before. R- immediately after, God goes and reprimands uh, his friends because they did not speak in the way, or in the right way that Job spoke. Even though Job said some crazy stuff, hit the repentance that he showed is what jo- God is talking about. That Job at the end of the day and always has a perfect heart toward God Amen. in that Amen. his desire is to do right in the sight of God and so what we have to learn always is that your heart is going to be the determining factor by which one is going to be saved if your heart is right then your soul will be saved if your heart is not right then you will be lost it don't matter what you do or don't do mm-hmm. that's going to always be the determining factor and so the, the problem with that that with people have anyway is that they try to they try to determine how good of a heart I have to have. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, or, or you deceive yourself in thinking that you have a good heart because you did this, that, or the other, or you felt some way about this, that, or the other, or whatever. 
And you say, well, my heart is good. But the reality, and this is the dangerous part for mm -hmm. saint, for souls, is that God is the one doing the judging. We aren't. You know, we can deceive ourselves easily. We can easily think that we're better than we really are. You know, you talk about the Pharisees, they judge themselves. They judge themselves according to, and in their eyes, they're right. Yeah. You know what I mean? They look at the, the public like and say, oh, they say, I, I, right. you know, I am, I thank you, Father, that I'm not like this publican, he says, in his prayer. Because in his, in his eyes, he thinks that he is right. Mm -hmm. He thinks that he's good. But he's, he's a, he's a, he's a, He's a sepulchre, you know what I mean? Like he, in, in, yeah. inside lies dead men's bones. And he's walking around, but he thinks that he's good. And so what we have to make sure that we always keep in mind is what is a good heart? It's one that seeks after God's righteousness and does it. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, without, you know, without, like I say, without a good, without a good heart, without a sincere heart toward God, there is no hope for anybody. Point blank, like point blank, period. So, uh, like I said, when you look at look at Job, it was a sin not unto death. But at the end of the day, it's his heart that determines God's response to him. That that's the key. If 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 Job is not, because Job responds the first time, he says, "Oh, I'm vile and this and that," but then God keep going, because <laughs> because yeah, yeah. at the end of the day, God has something He's purging, as you brought out excellently in your point. God is always working. He's purging this out of Job. He's like a child. Like a child that got frustrated and said something silly. They're a good kid overall, but you're going to get, I'm going to have to get after him because he, you ran your mouth, you said something you should have said. Yeah. So now I'm going to have some questions for you. Yeah. We're going to sit down, we're going to discuss some things. I may have to even touch you up a little bit. But that don't mean you throw the kid away, you don't put him out, I'm just on him. He's still, I, he's still dear to me. I still love him. He's a good kid. But I need to touch him up so that he can continue to be good and continue to develop in the way that he ought to. Amen. God bless you, brother. Hamilton. And before I pass the mic, uh, just want to add this. You know, uh, the heart, to see for both all things in desperate way, but God knows the heart. At the same time, he knows which hearts of leaders, like the Pharisees, Sadducees, he knows which hearts are leaders are desi desiring to do his will in repentance. Amen. For instance, the, the heart of a leader in the Pharisees, they had the heart of the Nic Nicodemus. There were different hearts, but still Nicodemus didn't come forth and repent and seek after Christ. And so you had the Pharisees, which didn't want to get baptized, neither did Nicodemus. And then you had Nicodemus, who was, was fearful, but still had some belief in the Son of God, but didn't want to submit to his will. And then you have a leader who submits to the whole will of God and when he sees an error he immediately fixes it and says that God doesn't like that I want to be in fellowship with God I repent and so you got different kind of hearts and then you got a heart like we said where he, they hide the sin or they hide the iniquity and then they, they don't confess and that's why he went to Job and told him those three friends of yours go and tell them they got to do a sacrifice that's right you know because I'll hear you with them I, I won't hear though he committed sin and then they falsely accused all of them sin, but God recognized, yeah, your heart is, is different than their hearts. And they need to, you need to go up to them and tell them I told you to put up a sacrifice, that they need to offer up a sacrifice ram. And so we'll be closing shortly. It's just a car go ahead. Oh, oh uh, mine was just a quick comment to what uh, Brother Hamilton was saying. Sure. That is why a flag goes up to be when a preacher is preaching and it's all about I this, I, I, I. That's a flag. That's right. Just serve me Jesus and him crucified. Amen. Because that's how a lot of uh, Christians have gone astray mm -hmm. following a man and they don't even realize it. When we come to worship, we come to worship and hear about Jesus and him that's crucified. Right. Right. Not I, I, I. Trust me, trust me, I. <laughs> you know. And to me, that's, a, that's an immediate flag and that's in response to with uh, Brother Hamilton was just saying. And so in Matthew chapter, we'll be closing shortly, Matthew 16, Matthew 16, verse 13. Uh, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, his disciples saying, Whom do men say thou art son of man am? They said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now, <clears throat> This is what people were saying. They were spreading this around. This was a saying among the Jews. 
He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Some say today, the Muslims, that he was uh, he's not the Son of God. He's just a prophet. Some so-called Hebrews say the Christ has not come yet. Jesus wasn't the Christ. He was a good man. He wasn't the Christ. Um, so-called atheists, they say that he's not the Son of God. That they don't believe in God. He doesn't exist. When we die, we'll all just return to the dirt. And that's, that's what happens. Verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood are not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Again, these different doctrines were being taught though. John the Baptist, Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So, they were saying he's one of the prophets. So, if you could imagine going up to a, a Jew, who is he? He's one of the prophets. And then another guy, he would say, he's Jeremiah. And then another guy, he would say, he's John the Baptist. And then another guy would say, Elijah. These different doctrines, different people are saying these things. Uh, and we have to be aware, ye shall not have occasion to use this proverb, the sayings of the Church of Christ that are not in the Bible. They're just sayings, some things people say. We have to be careful to not take them in if it's not scripturally provable. If there is no scripture that can validate, uh, it's that it's legitimate. You know, even to those who seen the angels, they seen the angels. They took the money. In their minds, as time passed by, if they were to come to the fold, exalt themselves or vaunt themselves, have you ever seen an angel? I've seen an angel. Of course, I committed a sin. You know, and taking the money, but have you ever seen an angel? You know, that's the way that he can vaunt himself up. You know, in a way to have whether respect or admonition among others. You know, uh, and so that's sayings in the Bible. The fathers have eaten sour grapes. The children's teeth are set on edge. Sayings in the Church of Christ have to be always proven. Ask the question. Where can I find that in the Bible? Because sayings sound good, especially when you, they, you have scriptures and then a saying right after. And the saying is not even in the Bible. It's just a, a, a cool saying. But we have to be careful not to have respect to persons, uh, but always question. Don't be afraid to question saints, uh, anyone, male, female, because then either you'll repeat it again or you'll have a fear to that person by the priest of the men and not by the priest of God and then what will happen is you'll fall under condemnation because you'll follow that individual instead of Christ I want to close shortly uh, I, Kevin I see your hand up um, I want to look at Matthew 15 verse 24 Matthew 15 24 and this was something that was brought as well that helped me out concerning eyesight uh, he says, but he answered and said, I am not sent. This is where the Canaanite woman's faith was tested. I want to start at verse 20, 22. Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto them, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she cried after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. And he said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which have fallen from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour and so Jesus told his disciples he said I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the, of the house of Israel you know in my mind I used to think uh, that this meant that he's not sent but unto the Jews but Jesus is saying I'm not sent just to the Jews but unto them That's right. I'm sent to the Gentiles according to the Old Testament scriptures so when you, you have to look at the context look at the Old Testament I am not sent but unto them. I'm not just sent 
to the lost sheep of Israel. I'm not just sent to them. I'm sent to the Gentiles as well. And so this helped me out as well in my walk. And you have to ask the question, what have I heard or listened to in, my, in the past that I still hold on to today that is contrary to God? Because we got to let it go, saints. we got to let it go. we gotta, we got to purge it up. Uh, Brother Kevin has his hand up. So, uh, yeah. Uh, you also wanted to say that, you know, Paul, uh, Paul, you know, he did purchase Roman citizenship with a high price. You can find that in Acts chapter 22. 22, if you go to verse, start at 26, all the way down to 28. It says, when the centurion heard that he went and told the chief captain, saying, take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. And then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yes. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum, up, with a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was free born. So you had mentioned that when he preached to the Gentiles and when he when he ventured further out from Jerusalem to, to preach to the Greeks, to the Gentiles, he said he used his Gentile name, right? Paul. Paul. So he, he, he used a Gentile. It wasn't a Roman name. It was a Gentile name. That's what you're saying. No, a Gentile he's born name. Listed, and verse 3 says, I'm very, very a man which is a Jew born in Tarsus, the city of Lystra. Yeah. Well, yeah, he was. I was saying, I was saying. Uh, That's a Roman name. If you look it up in Greek. Yeah, because you said, didn't you say Gentile name? Yeah, Gentile or Romans. Gentile or Roman? Yeah, Roman is a Gentile. Oh, the same thing. Okay, I got it. Exactly. Because you remember, like, because he went to the Jews first, because he he himself was born a Jew, but. The Jews, his own, didn't receive him. That's why the Lord had told him to go and preach to the Gentiles. Because the Jews, when he went to them first, they didn't receive him when he spoke to them. So he said, well, go and speak to the Gentiles. Because since the Jews didn't receive the words that he had spoke, he went and preached to the Gentiles later. So as he ventured further out during his missionary journeys, he no longer used his Hebrew name. Uh, you know, that was kind of like a Jewish custom. But he no longer used his Hebrew name, but his, he used his Roman name as he went further out and began, you know, preaching different areas. And so I just wanted to just throw that out there. Also, another scripture about what you're saying about he had spoke the Hebrew language. Uh, look at Acts 21 and verse 40. It says, and when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke unto them in the Hebrew uh, saying, saying. And so in verse 20, chapter 22, in verse 2, it says, and when they heard that he spoke in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept more quiet. And he said, I'm verily a man who is a Jew born in Tarsus, is the city of Sicilia, and then it goes on further and further. So, going back to what he's saying, Saul, Saul, why probably persecuted thou me? He was speaking the Hebrew language. Yes. Because he spoke to, to, to Jesus himself. But he spoke in the Hebrew language. That's why the people that heard him was astonished. Because it's like, this man speaks Hebrew. And so it was translated, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? in the English word in, in the scripture, but in actually he was speaking the Hebrew language, which was, in, which was interpreting Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? That's all I want to say on those two things there. So. That's right. Brother Ozan had his hand up. Thank you, Brother Kev. Oh, thank you, uh, I just want to, I, I'm, I'm sorry I was in the other class teaching. And I, I do want to read Acts 13 and 9. Uh, we want to make sure that we teach, that we just say what the Bible says. Uh, Acts 13, 9 said, Then Saul, who is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Uh, 
that verse says Saul is called Paul. Uh, it doesn't. We don't have scripture that validate Paul was called something somewhere and somewhere else called something. It just says he's called Paul. So he might have been called Paul in Jerusalem. Might have been called Paul anywhere. I saw the names are interchangeable. It's still the same individual. So uh, the Holy Ghost identifies through Luke that he is called both names. So it has no spiritual balance there. It has no holiness with either name. He is a Christian. He is a Christian baptized while he's called Saul, as we understand. And Ananias calls him Brother Saul and baptizes him. And he is called Paul also. So either name you use, there's no the holiness with Saul or Paul. It's just a name. And so we need to make sure we stand on that. Because I, I know that I was taught a doctrine that labeled one of the names were holy. There is no doctrine that says that. So Acts 13 9 says he is called both names. I, I just want to share that. I just want to look, look at the Greek yeah. before, before Sister Carl. Uh, the Greek for Saul is, the pronunciation is Solos. Uh, it says the Hebrew origin, the same as Saulos, mm -hmm. the Jewish name of Paul. Right. And then when you look at Paul, it says, pr pronunciation of that is Polos, a Latin of origin, remotely from a derivative of meaning the same, Paulos, the name of a Roman and of an apostle. And so just like my name, my name yeah. is Javier. Yes. In Spanish, it will not be pronounced Javier. Mm -hmm. It will be pronounced in Mexico Javier. Yes. So those individuals that will be amongst, they won't pronounce it the same way that if it was in America. So Amen. You made me think about Anthony. Anthony is, his name is Anthony, but some call him Tony. Yes. But Anthony Amen. and Tony are the same. That's right. So when, we, when he, uh, God did not do a name change on him, yes. but the Gentile part of his name was Paul. And when we read about the missionary journeys and we read all a afterwards, he's called Paul. That's what I, you know, from my study, I studied that. And I was trying to understand that because I thought about how Anthony was telling me, especially his younger part of his life, he'd go to doc they called him Tony, but his name was Anthony, just like you got William. Some may call him Bill, same person. That's right. And that's how with, uh, but it wasn't a duality of it used, you know, throughout afterwards. When he went about setting up the Gentile churches, he was called Paul. Mm -hmm. But some say have made it that God changed his name. And that's what we were speaking about earlier. Mm -hmm. God changed Abraham's name. He yes, changed he Sarah. But he didn't change Paul's name. This was just the name. And Paul's purpose when God on the Damascus Road was to go about setting. Because see, now the, the, the church, the Jews and the Gentiles were going to come together. You know, when Christ died on the cross. Yes. Well, he took and it's no more. The Jews, it's Jews and Gentiles too. They can all, you know, be a reward of salvation that God did in His Son. Good point, mm -hmm. sister. God bless you. This time uh, we'll be closing. Is there anything else that was needs to be brought up? Nothing else. Uh, okay. At this time, uh, for those listening, understand that Jesus said, "On this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell should not prevail against it." The original church in the Bible is still here today. Yes. It's still in existence. It's called Church of Christ. To be saved, you must hear the gospel that Christ came in the flesh. He died according to the scriptures, was buried and resurrected according to the scriptures. And he rose up and gave an instruction and commandment to his disciples to go into all the world, preach the gospel. He that believes and is baptized should be saved. He that believes not should be damned. To, for you to be saved, listen to my voice, you have to obey that gospel. Be baptized by male in the water and Christ will give you of his Holy Spirit afterward and if you have any questions you can call the number that's under the video in the description section and we'll give you more scriptures and details uh, to prove concerning salvation and what God wants you to do this time we're going to be closing uh, with uh, a prayer at this time so whoever can please close us out with a prayer